quite wrong. Okay. Ty Ferguson. Um, yeah, as I was just saying. I'm, 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 I'm flipping flummoxed already. Uh, right. Ex explain to me why you want to come on mm -hmm. on the podcast and and what you want to get from it, really, or, or yeah, what your intent is with it, if you don't mind, please. No, that's fine. So, I reached out to you very recently um, after my uh, beloved husband passed away on the 18th of June. Um, he took his own life. Um, and what I want to do is just reach out to other people and speak about some of the issues um, that he faced um, when he returned um, from being away with a trauma um, and, you know, speak about the trauma from the bereaved family side after somebody takes their own life. Um, it's a very emotional uh, subject, so it probably will get some tears along the way. And it's still very new for me, but I watched your podcasts and I really wanted to be able to uh, come down, do a podcast about the things I've just mentioned. Um, so I was happy that uh, you got back in touch with me and said, look, we can do this. Yeah, yeah I'll be honest, it, uh, I wasn't going to say yes. Um, and there was a few reasons for that. One was, it didn't happen long ago. Oh, we're talking June, we're now in yeah. October. Uh, I, that was one of the main reasons such a short time after my concern really is around you yeah. um, and your family um, and at the time I was on it I didn't know you'd been talking about it publicly already I mean you yeah. were saying earlier in the, in the car away you that you've been you've done uh, been on the ITV and stuff mm -hmm. like that with the same intent with the same trying intent. to get information out there and so it makes me feel a lot more comfortable if I'm honest yeah and the reason I ended up I think saying yes is well in Intent. What your intent is your to, to do is to help is to help other people with, information. With, people with information. And yeah. if you're comfortable coming on, then uh, obviously, I, I, obviously, I, you know, we had that conversation. And yes. Um, yeah. So I am, as unfortunate circumstances are, I'm I'm glad to be able to accommodate you. Yeah. Uh, can and I you, appreciate. Can you just give um? So Jamie was a Jamie was a combat medic. He was. Um. Can Can you give a brief brief over uh, a brief overview of of his career and how you guys met? So we met when I was working in the beloved Naffy at uh, Three Para in Colchester. Um, he came in one day um, and I hadn't seen him before and he looked, he looked so young. He looked like a baby. I was kind of like, you know, caught my eye and I was like, who's that? Um, and I wasn't a great one for dating and I was single at the time and um, I noticed him coming in and I thought, He's got the smallest feet of a man I've ever seen. And I said to him, you've got the smallest feet in NATO. And he was like, you cheeky guy. <laughs> Literally, how it started. And then we started dating and, and um, things progressed from there. We got married and we had a little boy. Um, his career was mm, 20 years. He uh, joined when he was 16 and died when he was 36 and he packed an, an, like an enormous amount into his career over 20 years. I, I think a lot of guys and girls do pack a lot in but he was, I don't know, he seemed to pack more in than, than average I think, you know, he went everywhere that he wanted to go, he volunteered for lots of different things and he did do Afghanistan, Iraq, Northern Ireland. Uh, with the lovely three para um, you know he he served in various different units done some years of special forces as a medic there um, went all over the world with them done lots of different things seen massive amounts of things and Jimmy was always a huge one for learning he was like an absolute sponge he would learn, he would teach himself to do absolutely anything. Um, a lot of the things other people found really quite funny. Uh, when I got quite really sick, I couldn't leave the house for a long time, about 18 months. 
saw and he knew I always liked to have nice nails and he was like, well, what am I going to do here? So he taught himself to paint my nails um, because he knew I'd like it. Uh, he watched a couple of YouTube videos and went, yeah, I can do that. And I was like, no, this is going to be a mess. But he was a perfectionist. And I think everybody would say that about him if he was going to do something. He did it all the way to the end. He wasn't the kind of person that would take something on and then bail out of it. Um, and he was dependable and he was reliable. Um, but towards the end of his career, especially from last year, um, things changed for him and he became quite... Um, I wouldn't want to say stressed, but he was, there was definitely something going on with him when he came back from Malawi. Um, and they had an incident out there and lost a soldier. It affected him very, very deeply. To the point, as I was saying to you before, that he resigned his paramedic qualification when he came home, immediately. He said to me, never wanted to practice medicine ever again after that experience. Um, and I think... In Jamie's case, what I came to realise was he had something I call stacked trauma. So it was one after the other, after the other, you know, and it got to the point where this last incident was the last straw for him. He really couldn't go on any longer. Um, so that's kind of our 20 years in a little nutshell. <coughs> Where do you want to start with? Where do you want to start with it? Um, I know you want to do. I think you said it before a during and an after. So yeah. you, wherever you listen, this is your this is your bag. Wherever you want to, where you, wherever you want to go now with this podcast, let's let's, let's do it. Okay. You. Okay. So wherever you feel appropriate, Sammy. So that was kind of, that's kind of like a really quick overview of, of um, Jamie in a nutshell uh, of 20 years. There was a lot more that went into those 20 years. Kind of stuff that I've forgotten, you know, that are in the back of my mind somewhere. And I think when he came, the last incident in Malawi was very tough on him. <clears throat> he, he's been, he'd been away before for very long periods of time in conflict zones and didn't come home as changed as he did that last time. Ch ch changed, in, <clears throat> changed in what way? He was haunted, absolutely haunted. You could see it in his face. Um, the inquest uh, into this young lad's death was being put off because you've got to gather a lot of information for the coroner. <clears throat> um and he found that immensely, immensely stressful. I think for the first time ever in his career, he wanted somebody to say to him, you'd done everything that you could do. There wasn't any more anybody could have done. You give him your absolute all. They all did. All the medics, you know, that the, were there at the time. And I think you wanted somebody to just say that when you did absolutely everything. Now, I could say that to him as his wife, but I could never say that to him in the terms that he wanted to hear it from, you know, colleagues or anybody in, in, in that position, in a military position, that would looked at it and said, you know what, you dug out blind and you've done absolutely everything you could and there was nothing, nothing more anybody would do. <clears throat> As his wife, I, I, you know, I could say, hand on heart, he will have given his absolute all. Yeah, he, he would. Any medic would. And I just think <clears throat> that was the very last straw for him when he came back. He was a changed person you know, because he was haunted by what had gone on in Malawi. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure he would have given it all. I, I, I... I, you know, I, I knew Jamie, and um, he was a very, very well-respected medic. Well, I knew him, and we hadn't been in touch for many, many years since since yeah. he went from three power and moved on to the other units. Um, did, was he aware when he came back of like that it, um, he was finding things difficult? Was he conscious of it? <clears throat> um, I think he was 
partially conscious of it, but I don't think he knew what it was. I don't think he knew what this thing was that he was failing. I don't think he could verbalise that. So <clears throat> he was a terrible nail biter. And I noticed when he came home from Malawi pretty quickly that he was biting his nails so badly. I said, I think you need to go in and uh, speak to your doctor. You know, go into the med centre and speak to a medical professional. Um, and he did. He did do that pretty quickly, within days of me saying, I think that's what you should do. And I didn't have to <clears throat> push him out the door or, uh, you know, bend his arm up his back to get him to go. He, he did just go. Um, and he was very quickly diagnosed with an acute stress reaction uh, from the, the, the incident in Malawi. Um, and that's as much as I know about that. I don't know any more. Um, obviously, I wasn't privy to his conversation with his doctor or anything like that. Um, and he seemed to be all right. He seemed to be okay. He seemed to be a little bit lighter from the conversation he'd had. Um, but as the days and weeks went on, he must have been, and I didn't see it, I didn't see it coming, I didn't see anything. And I thought, I, I, I thought I watched him quite intently, but I didn't see it. it. You know, I hid that really well from everybody, nobody seen it. So in February of this year, we bought a house kind of fed up with living in the military married quarters, as we all know, they're fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and we got to the point where we thought, well, we want to put down some roots. I've been moving around for 25 years, and I'm kind of like, I was done with it, and I think he was too. He was like, oh, no. And we found a really beautiful place we wanted to live. Uh, so, you know, we live in Fife in, in Scotland, and it's gorgeous. But we found this house, went ahead and bought it, Moved in, he ran around like a superhuman person, decorating, painting, moving things around, making things, <clears throat> anything. And when I look back on it now, what he was actually doing was just getting it ready so he could leave. Um, so he knew I wouldn't have to do that. That was something I wouldn't have to think, how am I going to manage this? How am I going to, uh, you know... He, he wanted to make it, so it was lovely. <clears throat> and I wouldn't have to think about that kind of thing once he was gone. Um, I just thought he was rushing around doing stuff because he was impatient. I just thought, you know, this is typical Jamie. It, you know, once he starts something, he likes to get it done. Um, and during that time, he taught himself to <laughs> make knives. So he built a forge in the garden. <laughs> he absolutely loved it. And do you know, Hugh, he was good. He was really good at it. What a surprise. Um, <clears throat> so decorating the house and he's making knives for his friends. You know, people who he went out shooting with, stalking with, you know, passing them on his gifts, something that he'd made himself. Was, you know, it's great. Um, and a couple of days before he died, we were standing in the garden and we've got the most amazing view of Edinburgh across the fort. Um, it's beautiful. And we stood in the garden and I said to him, I've never been so happy and content in my whole life. Now, I'm 51, so, you know, it's been, I've been waiting a while to be that happy and content. Moving around makes it tough to be, you know, content and, and moving around every two or three years is, it is an absolute ball ache sometimes. So we bought this house and I said to him, you know, I'm so happy, I'm so content. And he said, me too. And then when I look back on that now, I, I, look, I look back on that conversation and I know that was his cue to go. Because he couldn't, he couldn't, he was in so much pain. And Robert, I mean, 
you, you, you spoke before about um, how much you thought you'd been you'd been planning it. Yeah. Um, and hugely intelligent guy as well, you know. Uh, Bright as a boy. Yeah. Over that period from Malawi um, to a few months after and earlier on this year, with it's very much more aware, uh, sorry, pu pu public, much more accessible now and, and uh, obvious now, I think, compared to previous, how much support there is there for yeah. people <laughs> who are suffering in whatever yeah. way, be that military or be it not military, yeah. right? And there's always been especially a focus on, a big drive on just trying to show people. Military and ex-military, there's, there's support for mental health there. Yeah. Was any of that, it did, how does that play into this in, in the build-up? I mean, was any of that explored? What was, any, what was, the, what was the blockers? Because there must have obviously been blockers. So, um... And the re sorry, and the reason I ask, okay, mm -hmm. is you and I both know, and people listening to this and watching this know, yeah. that you can have as much support out there as you want, but there, is, there are, sometimes there are reasons that that support doesn't connect with the person who needs it, yeah. and then the worst happens. Yeah. And this, unfortunately, is one of those scenarios. Um, do you want to talk about that? <clears throat> so, uh, the morning Jamie died, um, sometimes he slept in the spare room because if he was getting up for work, his alarm clock used to go on my nerves because he used to press snooze constantly, like 900 <laughs> times. And I'd be like, for the love of Jesus, just turn it off. So if he had to go up for work the next day, he'd be like, look, I'll sleep in the spare room because I know I'm going to hit snooze 900 times. So I'd be like, fine. And he had to go into work the next day and send an email. I think Brigade wanted to have a look at his qualifications. Um, and I think that was a cue to Jamie to think something else was coming up. Um, they wanted to have a look at his paramedic registration. And he tried explaining, look, I'm not registered anymore. And they said, well, just send the email to confirm you're not registered anymore. So he was like, right, no problem. I'll go in the next day. So that was on the Wednesday. Thursday morning, he comes into the bedroom at half past five. And I thought, this is early. You are really came to get in there and send that email and get back home. Because he was doing stuff in his man cave. There was another knife on the go. So I was like, right, OK. And he said, uh, I'm off to work, love. And I was like, right. And so he gave me a kiss and he said, uh, I love you, I'll see you later. And he never came home. Now, the reason I, I speak about that piece there is because when he died, he made a video on his mobile phone for me. Um. And in that video, he does say, in his own words, that he asked for help, and they didn't listen, and he didn't understand. And they were some of his last words, and that's devastating as a family, absolutely devastating. Um, in the video, he said he, he can't live with it anymore. And you can see it in his face here, you can definitely see he's a haunted man, and that had come to the absolute end and then he couldn't take the pain anymore. Um, so he had connected and I don't know why that we didn't have the outcome that Jamie should have had. I don't know that yet. Um, I'm unsure if I'll ever know the answer to that. It's, you know, the questions have been asked but then you know, so these things are a long process. Um, his service inquiries are up and coming, so that probably will answer some of those questions. But we'll we'll say I, I won't know until I read it. Um, and then I it got to about ten or eleven o'clock, and I'm thinking, well, this is a long email. Like, where's he gone off to? What's he doing? He, he's he's obviously gone off shopping for more stuff for <laughs> man cave to make something else. So I started texting him and and phoning him, and there was no answer, and I thought. That's weird. Maybe he's on a conference call. And I went upstairs into the bathroom and the, the window was open and I think, I looked out because something caught my eye and I seen two guys walk up to the front door and I thought, 
they're going to be trying to sell me gas and electric. <laughs> like, because I'm not having it. No. So, down the stairs, and I open the door. And you know something before you even know it. And they asked me if I was Mrs. Ferguson. I said, yeah. And they said, wife of Jamie Ferguson. I said, yeah. And they said, can we come in? And I went, no. Because I'd seen that they had police tags, like ID tags. And I said, can we just talk about this here? And he went, no. So put the dogs away, otherwise the police would have been a nice snack for the dogs. Um, and they came in, sat down, and very professionally, very matter of fact, said, we found the body of a deceased male and the location. And I said, oh, no, you've got the wrong person, because he's at work. And they said, no, he left his passport out to be identified. And that's when the world, when I was saying to you in, in, in the car, you expect the whole world to just stop. People to stop going around their daily business to actually acknowledge that something horrendous has just happened. But, you know, it's not like that. And I must say that the, the policemen were really kind. I don't think I could talk for about 10 or 15 minutes. I just... I, I couldn't comprehend what they were saying. And then I had to obviously break the news to my son, who was upstairs. Um, and then to our daughters, my family, his work, his work didn't know. He'd taken his life in a different location. I don't even know if he'd gone into work that morning here. I've got no idea if he'd gone in at all. Um, and then it, the impact of it, it this, then the after, the impact of of what's just happened to you. You can't actually physically comprehend that your husband, who you said goodbye to a few hours earlier, isn't going to come back through that door. No matter how much you want to change things, he's never going to be coming back. And that takes such a big effort and a long time for that thinking that you're never going to see them again. And I think a part of me will always be waiting for him to come home. Um, and I think those early days, you don't really take anything in. <clears throat> Your whole life, you like, you feel like you're living in an, uh, an alternate universe. Have you ever seen Fringe, the TV show, where there's an alternate universe and everybody's doing It's a bit like that. <laughs> it's a bit like living in this, and weirdly, me and Jamie used to watch Fringe all the time. It's a bit like being in, you live in somebody else's life. That doesn't quite fit. It's like a skin that doesn't fit. That's not yours, but you have to wear it now. Um, and I think that it's got to be the most traumatic and devastating event of, of my whole life. I couldn't function for a long time. Um, but what I, I knew what I wanted to do very quickly, and I felt very strongly about was telling his story, connecting with media, speaking to reporters. Um, I, I spoke to them all. I spoke to everybody. What, why is that? Because I think it's it's very important that people can see and read his story. That he, Yes, he was a soldier, but he was a human being. He was a man. He had a family. He had feelings. And he couldn't carry the burden of the things he'd seen. And I think it's in the, the, the most powerful thing to help other people is to read or hear a story that they can connect with on that level. Um, and that this doesn't always have to be the outcome. Um, there is services there and we need to figure out why some people don't connect with it or why, you know, when people like Jamie have connected with the service where it's broken down and how that can be fixed and going forward, how you can prepare uh, soldiers, seamen, airmen, for seeing trauma and being resilient and um, having the tools to cope with better with the trauma. Um, because I think 
you you can you can send people anywhere and they can see all this trauma but if you can get in at the beginning and prepare them better i think it's you know it might fare better than trying to stick a band-aid on it at the end if that makes sense you know just trying to fix something that's already broken if you can be proactive Yes, we have to be reactive in some situations. I understand that. But if we can be proactive in the beginning and give them more tools, better tools, to build up resilience to mental trauma, I think that will help. And the way you can do that is get the story out there and speaking about it. And I've, like I say, I've spoken to, it's always been on my terms. I've always reached out to the people I want to speak to, which is how, you know, how I reached out to you because I wanted to, this opportunity to um, put his story out there. Um, I know some people found it very strange that I connected with the press quickly and that I connected with journalists, uh, anybody that would speak to me very quickly. But to me, it was really important to, if, if this can happen to my husband, the love of my life, I don't want it to happen to somebody else. I don't want somebody else to get somebody walk up their path to say, this has happened and I'm so sorry. Um, if this can help one person, that's good. Mm. And I'm good with that. There's a... Uh, I, I, it's difficult. And it's a difficult thing when that's, that's when someone's left the military, that is, I can see how. Now I didn't want to get mudslinging on this, right? Yes. Yeah. But I can see. I'm just thinking right now. I can see how it is an extremely challenging, as challenging it is to mili or anyone in the civilian world, never mind ex-military. Extremely challenging to be proactive in seeing and being seeing in your own, in yourself you've got issues, or seeing that someone else got issues as one. For the monitoring side of things, and yeah. two, getting the right support to them. I can see how that's that's extremely challenging. What I what I don't understand in this day and age, I really don't understand this day and age in 2020, that a serving soldier or a serving sailor or a serving airman or woman, how how there is no there is not suitable proactive work or monitoring of someone who could have an issue. Is in place. I, 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 in my in my head, there is apps, and there is absolutely no reason why it can't be in place. Right. I agree. Um, the, the manpower is there. We we have a, a very uh, complicated but capable system in, in place in the military to do mm -hmm. whatever we want to do. Um, it just at the moment that that monitoring side of things isn't in place, and and I think part of that issue. That proactivity and monitoring is in place. And I think part of the issue there is it's a knowledge thing. I think, yes. you know, uh, maybe in 10, 15 years' time, when the young privates, the young, you know, the, the, the young ranks of now, no. and they're in the senior senior leadership position, yes. they're the WOs. That is not me um, putting detriment to the people in senior positions now. No. It's the knowledge and experience thing. When they get to that position, I would, I'm going to guess we're in, going to be in a far better place, but it doesn't mean it can't be improved now. I mean, in Jamie's situation, it's like a, it's a flag straight away, right? Yes. Especially in the military, especially with someone who's done uh, all that experience he had, lot, lots and lots of traumatic events that he had, especially as a medic. I would never want to be a medic. Like, yeah. one, I haven't got the mental capability to do it. It's like a black art to me. Mm -hmm. um, and to 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 have to do the job of trying constantly trying to save people's lives and if it goes wrong it must be horrendous. Yeah. And and why why isn't there a monitoring system in place now? Why isn't there a screening system in place now? Why aren't we able to do it? And that's a rhetorical question, right? Mm -hmm. we, sh we should have it in place and people are trying to make it happen. It just it needs to happen, I think, faster, you know. I think everything takes time. And unfortunately that just that's one of the things you can't really get mm -hmm. around is that things do take time to put in place. It's irritating and as you know, annoying as that is to even think about. Because you just think, well, why don't you just why don't, why can't you just put it in place? What's the problem? But then I just say that from 
from being a wife's point of view, being a bereaved wife, I don't see all the, everything that goes on in the background. So what I have to do is take a step back and think, hang on a minute. It doesn't work like that. Things have to be put in place, then they have to be implemented. But what I think is, Jamie suffered terribly with trauma stacking. A lot of the time, you know, uh, army recruits from impoverished areas, we all know that, you know, they recruit from poor areas, at my neck of the woods in the northeast being one of them. Um, and I think a lot of people join the military with a trauma, a childhood trauma. I, I've I've seen it a lot. I I don't know if you've if you've seen it yourself. Um and then you have you join the military and you could possibly have other traumas stacked on top. So my thinking is you've got to have comprehensive screening at the beginning through all the way throughout somebody's military career that's got to be continuous and then once they leave the services it's got to continue that that's got to, it's got to be there it's got to be an option it can't just stop the day you leave you don't just leave the military and go, well, that's my trauma, it's, it's finished, it's absolutely fine. You, you're going to be carrying that with you. And who knows what kind of issues that's causing for that individual. I think if that can go from the beginning, the middle, and all the way through to the end of that person's life, that will make a difference. I, I definitely do think that it would make a difference. Um that's got to be something that's look. I know next year, um, for every soldier, regardless of rank, every uh, tri service will have mandatory mental health training. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but that 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 I would suppose that's right. That's good. That's a start, right? It is a start. And, and um, I think the other thing. I think maybe look. The other thing is, um, I think maybe that. The, not as much attention is paid to uh, a a person who a person in the military experiences a traumatic event in the military uh, as as is done in other services, right? And and I think just because it's the military, it's that not a stigma around it. It's how they they're trained to handle stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah, we are. But it also doesn't mean it doesn't have a bloody effect, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, look at the police, for example. Yeah. The, the police, for example, and they were doing this 10, 15, 20 years ago. If an officer is involved in a shooting or a stabbing or something that is deemed as a a, a significant incident, yeah. they are they 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 that person or the people on that patrol or whatever it is, they are, they have they have a marker placed on them, and it, it, you know in in a, uh, yeah like a, a marker in, mm -hmm. if I want to call it that. And they have to go then go. There is a process you have to follow follow afterwards. Okay. That is a could it, could be counselling, could be screening, could be monitoring, could be testing, could be whatever. They don't get pulled out of their job. Sometimes they, I think sometimes on the, depending on the incident they get put on you know like a week or a week in forced leave or whatever. Yeah. But the point is they have a process there that is mandatory. You have to go through that after you've been in a significant incident. Now the problem with the military is that is not that is not always practical because operations yeah. you know jamie would have been on operations where there have been repeated traumatic events that he exposed yeah. to uh, that could be a, a, a flipping you know a, a, a contact a, a firefight it could be uh casualty there's to deal with it could be a, a bomb going off but all in the same operation it's not practical to be able to have as comprehensive a system as for example the police do yeah so you can have a system nonetheless you could yeah. still have a process nonetheless you could we have we have people in the units so who are certainly analyzing mental health it undergoes some form of mental health screening training, mental health training, trim, for example, trim, right? Yeah. There is nothing to say you couldn't have some sort of more comprehensive process because there is a, there is a process now, but yeah. it is not comprehensive enough. And you absolutely bang over the screening. You need the proactive, and you also need the reactive. Yeah. And the, the reactive bit is what's missing at the moment. Yeah. The problem, again, another problem with it is, and, and this is not a problem that can't be overcome, is the thousands and thousands of people just in Afghan and Iraq that went through those kind of incidents. Mm -hmm. But just because they shed loads of people who've gone through traumatic incidents, doesn't mean they're all going to have massive issues. But 
you know, identify the ones, y you need to have a start point. They all yeah. need to go through the process. Yeah. How far they go through the process depends on what the screening and the testing and the, that results in. Yeah. You know? I know Jamie uh, was trimmed after the event in Malawi. And then he went back and done it like a, when he came home, he done an ex, like an ex step or a follow up to trim, went in and done that. Um, he did tell me he did that. I don't know what that involved or what they spoke about or, or anything like that. That he, If he wanted to speak about that, he would have spoke to me about that. I was always, did it go okay? Are you okay? Do you need something? Is there something, is there anything I can do for you? Um, because I always, wa I always wanted to take care of him. I, I think a lot of the time as a wife, or as a husband, or as a partner, you feel very protective of them. You just want to put a bubble around them, and but you can't do that. You know, the world's just not like that. Um, but he knew, and I always said, I will always listen. I might not have anything to add to say, you know, but I'll, I'll always listen to you, always listen. And I would always encourage him to get help and I, in any situation. Um, but he couldn't talk to me. And I don't take that personally. I don't, I can't because it wasn't personal. You know, um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not offended by that or anything ridiculous like that. Um, and you're always immensely proud of them and you always want them to be healthy. Because you always think, oh, you know, I, w I want him to be healthy and fit. But you've also got to think, I want him healthy and fit in his mind. These two things, physical fitness and mental fitness, there shouldn't be any distinction between them. Having a mental trauma is just like having a broken bloody leg, only you can't see it. I suffer with what they call an invisible illness myself. People can't say what's wrong with me. They say I walk with a stick, but they cannot say what my illness is. And it's a bit like that. If I had a physical injury, you could see the reason why I walk with a stick, you know. Uh, it, having a mental trauma, it's just not a, it's not there for people to physically see. So I think people are getting better at it now, but they kind of discount it. Even now, I know people, I know serving soldiers that are struggling to get any kind of help in their chain of command for mental health issues, serious mental health issues. They literally like pull yourself together. And you're like, like you said earlier, it's 2020. What are you doing? It is a, the other the, yeah and the other the other side to that piece on, I was talking about just now with and you were talking about the proactive the reactive and everything in between the other piece to that is is the knowledge of the individual themselves and the people they're surrounded by just general mental health mental yes. the mental health awareness which is a massive piece of it um, and just generally society as we've heard before you know the more people that are aware of the mental health, the more people are constantly exposed to that information in a positive way, yes. right? Then the more understanding they are of it, which means that the stigma around Definitely. any stigma you see around speaking about it, just generally society, but also it would carry into the military, the stigma you see around um, talking about it and being worried about the impact in your career, being worried about your mates thinking about you, being worried about your commanders thinking about you or what your subordinates think about you, worrying about all of that, that can be, will be solved by that increased awareness of, of mental health yes. like you say physical fitness and mental fitness this, this fitness that's it it's fitness and in that it's physical and mental okay mm -hmm. and both affect each other and yes. both can help each other um they, they're intertwined and sometimes they're, they're completely isolated from each other but they affect each other um and that that awareness is another thing you know uh and going back to what you're talking about where you know he, he didn't didn't speak to you about it in in depth, no. that, there's two pieces to that, as we said before. Yeah. There's one. It's not everything special in the military. Uh, they don't. They don't. 
you won't understand the way no. they need you to understand. Absolutely. That as a day as he, so I'm not so as Jamie specifically. I'm just saying as they see it yes. sometimes. And the other side is, Sammy, it's a protection thing. Yeah. They don't want to burden you with it. They don't want to upset you. They don't want you worrying. And you I know. get that. I do. I understand that. You know, I, being chronically sick myself it does affect your mental health because this has gone on for such a long time and there's no treatment and there's no cure. So it does inevitably affect your mental health. There's no two ways about it. And I was guilty of the same thing. I wouldn't want to burden my husband with the thoughts I had around my physical limitations now and, and, and things like that. I, I, I didn't, definitely didn't want to burden him with that. Um, in fact, I didn't want to burden anybody with that. So I took myself off and, and, and got some help with that outside with somebody that knew exactly what I was talking about because they were a sufferer themselves or have been a sufferer in the past um, and knew exactly what I was talking about. So I, I absolutely understand, you know, the points that you've just that you've just said, and I, I, I do get that, um, um, especially about the burden part. Um, I think that would have definitely been in the back of his mind, you know, and sitting chatting about things. And you know, we had a we always had a bit of banter between us. We always had a laugh, li like literally all the time. And I would do stupid stuff to make him laugh because I just like the same smile. Even after all these years of marriage, when he's playing on his PlayStation, I'd still flash him at my age. <laughs> so, just to make him crack up. Every time I walked into the sitting room, he'd switch his microphone off because he knew I'd say something stupid. Um, and I think, without being aware of it at the time, I was doing that more in the days before his death. And I haven't shared this with many people, but I wanted to share it today. I was having nightmares about dying. And now I think about it, and I say to Jamie, oh, I'm having these nightmares, and it was such a comfort. And he was just, he was a kind soul, and he was gentle, and he was generous for his time. And he always made me feel, feel better about those points, and especially having these kinds of dreams. And when I think back now, I think I was kind of picking up on something from him. Um, and I wasn't conscious of it. That it. It's one of those things that you can't say until you look back. You know, after something's happened and you look back and you go, why was I having those kinds of dreams? What do we, I don't know. Or I feel like I, I was getting something from him subconsciously. Um, and I, I just, I assumed it was me having some kind of wobble. Uh, you know, I'd lost, lost my parents a couple of years ago, both of them. And, and like I said, being in such bad health, I just thought I was having a bit of a wobble at the time. But now when I look back at it, I definitely think I was picking up something from him. Because I was so in tune to him all the time. You know, it, it was... I was angry at myself that I didn't say exactly what was happening, but he, he, he hid that like a master. In in retrospect, Sammy, um, he, um, in those sort of months, weeks, days before, in fact, just, just to give this context, what I'm going to ask mm -hmm. is, there's a, with my own experience with people who've um, taken their lives, I remember the first guy that I knew did it, ex-military, and uh, much like with Jamie, I think he was completely out of the blue. Couldn't believe it. Of all the people, uh, yeah. for his friends and his colleagues, of all the people, he was the last person. God, Jesus Christ, no, no way. What? And his name was Pete, Peter Sullivan, Ronnie. Could could not believe it that it happened. Um, and it was a, apart from the, a couple of members of his family it was very, very well hidden. Um. And he wasn't in communication with many people anyway. Mm -hmm. But so, so on that note, um, again, retrospectively, looking back, 
often like the nail biting. Is there anything that you, any of the behaviours or anything that you that you now saw sort of built up or, or apart from the immediate change when you came back from Malawi that you can think of that that were relevant or not? I, I'm, I'm asking this with just no. just for anyone who's been listening. No. no, no. He was still making plans. He rang his friends a couple of days before he died. At one the day before he died, actually making plans to do stuff at the weekend. Like I say, he had a project going in the man cave. Um, we had plans ourselves. We booked a holiday at Christmas. Uh, he had plans with, uh, because, it, you know, his last post, he was a permanent staff instructor with the reserves at, uh, in Dundee. Um, and, you know, he, he was still going into work and sent out emails and being in touch with his reservists and encouraging them to do training and things like that. Because it was, you know, during the time when COVID was literally ripping everybody's lives apart in the beginning. Um, and so he was encouraging them to still do their fitness and still go out, you know, be outdoors and, and because that always gives you such a boost. And he knew that. And when I spoke to some of his friends after he died, and they said, well, I only spoke to him the day before he died, and he was making plans with me to do this, this, and this. So nobody is saying a thing. I would have noticed had he stopped planning, um, saying, I, I'm, I'm going to do this, or look at this new rifle, I want to buy that's going to cost a fortune. <laughs> or... I'm stalking it, you know, I'm I'm off up the hills with his friend Duffy and, and you know, I'm off to do this. But he hadn't stopped making plans. Why why do you think wh why do you where do you think that comes into it where you're where it was also obviously pre premeditated and pre planned yeah. as far back as when you bought the house, you think? Yeah. So do you think that, that sort of behaviour is kind of as normal that just came as part of just maybe he didn't think that he would go through at some point exactly. maybe there was hope that he'd get out or uh, then he would come through it okay or maybe it was kind of normal because that's life what you get on and do and you still had the plan I think he was making plans in case he hadn't gone through with it that's exactly what I think knowing Jamie I, you know and I don't know um how many times my husband left the house thinking he wouldn't be coming back. I don't know that. I just only know the last time. Um, I, I, like I said, I don't know how many times he, he thought, I, this is what I'm going to do today. And I have no idea. Um, and you just, ridiculously, you know, you just want to, we have a magic wand. It turned back down. Anything, all the things you can't do. Eddie, he was my best friend. He was a good man. He was a great dad. He was such a good role model to Lucas. You know, he taught him how to do absolutely everything. He's the most self-sufficient 13-year-old boy I've ever met. He cooks all his own food. He washes all his own clothes. He irons all his own clothes. He can sew anything. You know, oh, I've got a hole in this, right? I'll just stitch it up because my dad taught me how to do it. Anything. And he was a, a great, great stepdad to our daughters. Uh, he was a great role model to them too. Hard work and dedicated kind. And he was ambitious. He, you know, he wanted to get on in his career and he wanted to go as far as he could. Um, I think that stems back to his childhood. He didn't have, he was an only child and he didn't have a grand life with his parents, unfortunately. And um, that spurred him on to, he grafted, grafted for everything he had, everything. He would graft his backside off for everything. Um, and that made us immensely proud and it's given Lucas a good work ethic I hope but he is a 13 year old boy so we'll see um, 
but he was absolutely, you know, like all of us that have lost a loved one to uh, suicide, they were everything to us. Um, I, I would have continued following him around the country where the, wherever his career had taken him. I was happy to, to tag along and keep the home going and all that kind of thing. You know, stop it from burning down while he's away, etc. Stop the dog running off while he's not there or averting some kind of homely disaster. But, um, yeah, my I think coming to terms with the fact that my life is not how I planned it anymore. It's not how I had it mapped out in my head. Um, it's hard and I, I, I can't do that right now. What... Um what has it been like since in terms of how are you, how are you, get, how are you getting through it? How, are you, how is the family getting through it? What Are you, are you getting much support? So that brings me to another point that I've written down in my little pad that I wanted to raise because I think it's important that people should, should know. Um, when Jamie died, uh, we were assigned a visiting officer and I've got to say he is an amazing human being. He has been an absolute rock to my family. He's been honest, courageous on my behalf and um, so supportive, very uh, kind and compassionate man. Um, Are you able to name him or not? No. I don't know. I don't know. Don't. Okay. Anyway. I don't know. But he's, he is amazing. Um, so, well, I quickly found out that that is it. That is the extent of really any kind of practical help like that. You do get um, financial advice. You do get um, a purple pack from the MOD. A what pack? A purple pack. So whenever somebody dies in service, the MOD issue, what they call a purple pack. It's like this big plastic purple folder with things in uh, charity leaflets and all kinds of stuff. Um, paperwork that you have to sign, you know, after somebody's died. Um, m mountains of stuff in there. But what I found is that I've had to source any kind of help for my son, myself. Nobody said, listen, Sam, this is in place for Lucas. This is, this, you know. What, this what, what kind of support are you talking about? You have to find yourself. Counselling. Practical counselling support. So I have sourced that myself um, through Scottish Little Soldiers who are fantastic, fantastic, I can't praise them enough, and they signpost you to a charity specifically to help children, bereaved children, called Winston's Wish, who I've got to say have been fantastic also. Very good. And Lucas started his counselling a few weeks ago, um, and that's, that's going to continue. Uh, his school has been amazing, by the way. They're really, really good. That's it the end what, what any about kind of private so the older children there's nothing what about for you counselling wise no. support wise no I had to say is anybody from welfare going to speak to me or not I'm still waiting um, nobody from welfare contacted me as in army welfare or unit, unit welfare, welfare. Unit Welfare and the Army Welfare Service, I had to reach out to them and say, are you going to talk to me or not? Um, and they did eventually, but I found... How long are we talking? When you say eventually, how long are we talking? So what are we now? October, so September. So... Um, I was speaking to a young gentleman, which from Army Welfare Service, which would have been good if he didn't like the sound of his own voice. And when you're in a bereaved state, 
the last thing you really want to do is listen to somebody else talk at you. And I just couldn't continue that. I just said, no, that, that's not for me. No disrespect to anybody in the Army Welfare Service. However, that was my experience at that time. Um, so, yeah, that's it. When, they, when the Unit Welfare eventually got in touch with it in September... Unit Welfare have never been in touch with so me. That was, that was Army Welfare Service. That got in touch but with me. But his unit have got a responsibility, surely, to get in touch with you? Yes or no? Or, or do we not know? They do. They do. They have a duty to do that. But I'm still waiting. So why, you, why is that? That, okay. that is absolute fucking bullshit. <laughs> absolute bullshit. I'm language. because I'm, it is It's shy. absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. So, what we have to remember is, Jamie was a permanent staff instructor for reservists. So, when something like this happens, they have absolutely no fucking, excuse my French, idea how to deal with somebody like me. So what did they do? They didn't deal with me. But hang on. This is the military. They have processes. They have procedures. And it might, let's just say for one second, there's no process of procedures. You're in the welfare office, and one of your soldiers, regardless of a reservist or not, and one of your soldiers has died, regardless of how they've died or not, you're in the welfare unit. The job is welfare. Those people, out of the kindness of their fucking heart, should go out their way to get in touch with you, with any families. I don't think they wouldn't. I can't, I actually can't believe it. It makes me feel very lucky from the unit I'm from to to have the people there that we do who are completely opposite. See, I, I, I cannot I, believe it. You know, and I have to say, one of the best experiences of welfare I've ever had was at Three Palace. When Jamie and I were, were uh, married in 2006 and expecting a baby. That's when I found out I had uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, and they were amazing. When welfare aimed to do a good job, they should look at that. should look at that experience I had. Um, it, and welfare can be very hit and miss, definitely. And had he still been in his previous unit, um, can I name them? Uh, I I wouldn't just when he was when he was serving with the, the special his previous unit. posting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It would have been a very, very different outcome. Very different. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. You can't. It was in the papers. Yes, yeah, it was in the papers. Yeah. But well, that wasn't his previous posting. Oh, sorry, well, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, his previous posting, this would not have happened. So I think they didn't know how to do with me, so they just didn't. Um, I found certain persons interfering in things they had no business interfering in, like my husband's funeral. What, what do you mean? So, um, it was during the time of COVID, when it was, obviously it was still going through COVID, but this was near the beginning, in June. So, um, Fife Council, Living Fife, Fife Council was contacted and said, look, we have a military funeral. We would like a bearer party and a shooting party. And they said, yes, we understand. Go ahead. That did not happen because certain people didn't want pictures getting into the press of maybe somebody breaking social distancing rules. I can, un I can understand that. I, can I had an understand. outside service here. Nobody would have been breaking social distancing rules. Oh. Mm -hmm. The story was also put out there. I have found the source of the story. They shall remain nameless. They are military. To say that it was restricted numbers to 20. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't know where this story's come from. There is no restriction on numbers. It's an outside service. It's grey side. That's why I chose that. When you say story, I'm, I, I'm assuming you mean they've given this instruction inside yes. the unit. Yes. So they told the unit only 20 people can go to uh, Jamie Ferguson's funeral when that was not the instruction. That was all. disseminated all Why would they do that? In, in, in other social media, on other social media platforms. 
So I was running around like an idiot going, this is not true. This is not true. You can attend. The next thing was, we don't want anybody in uniform. Fair enough. Only a couple of people. Why, why, why? Why is that? Because they, they didn't want the press taking pictures. So someone having a knee-jerk reaction, going, getting a bit, getting a bit worried about... They didn't say to me, the, however. Right, yeah. They never came to me directly and said, this is what we want. I'm sorry, this is how it's going to be. Nobody did that. Um, some people were turned away. I didn't get the memo saying, please don't wear a uniform. I put that out everywhere I could. Please don't wear a uniform. You know, I don't want you to be... I don't want anybody getting into trouble. A couple of people were turned away, which I think was disgusting. Uh, uh, who turned them away? Military? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so once you start, once those little things like this start happening, you quickly, become, you quickly come to a point where you can't cope. You cannot cope. You feel like this person that was the love of your life, your husband, your whole world, was somebody else's property. It wasn't my property. Or it wasn't anybody else's either. Um, and it was just handled so badly. So badly. That I said, for a certain person never to contact me again, I'm not interested in having a conversation with that person. Um, that person should know better, did know better, could have done better, should have done better. Um, I think Jamie was all that. Again, I'm struggling to understand you. Why, why stuff like this is, is, is going on when a death in service is no strange event. A, a death in service is no strange event over the last 10 years, 15 years. It is no strange event. It's not. Okay, these are as unfortunate as they are. I'm talking general, I'm not just specifying about suicide. Yeah. Generally, fortunately, these are, these are common events of the fucking army. It's mm -hmm. the Navy, it's the Air Force, and we've had Afghan and Iraq and, and, the, and other operations going on. Mm -hmm. So why is this any different? Apart from the COVID impact, why can't people turn up in uniform? Why if the social distancing in place and it's outside? Why? Why? Again, I go back to it. Why on earth has the unit welfare office? Not being in touch. Not being in touch. What kind of people are in that office to not get in touch? I I absolutely staggered by it. I'm absolutely staggered by it. Staggered by it. It's just, <clears throat> I think probably the measure of the person, the individual. Oh, they're in the office. Yeah, I think the whole the whole unit as a whole didn't know how to do with me because they this this is just not something they ever thought they would nobody ever thinks they're going to have to handle this situation however other units might have had some experience now help was offered to his unit from his previous unit to help with practical things like the funeral we can organise that. We can, had it been done by them, we wouldn't be having this kind of conversation. But they said no, thinking they knew best um, for whatever reasons. I don't know. Nobody ever spoke to me about this. Um, and it's caused me a lot of tears, a lot of anxiety, anger, frustration beyond belief. Um, that this was my experience. Um, and that's another thing I do not want happening to another family, ever, is having the experience I had. Luckily for me, I had a lot of family around me and a lot of friends. But not everybody's got that. Not everybody's got that system in place. They could end up going through a negative experience like I have alone. And I, that gives me the fear, really. Um, I know how much of a struggle it was for me with the support. I can't even imagine what it's like without, you know, without the support of a family. I could be living in a different country. You know, the family could be thousands of miles away, uh, and this is not. This is not the experience people sh people like me should have. Absolutely not. 
what is it that you're missing at the moment? What what is it that you need? Like other support? Um, yeah. What 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 are the missing pieces? In fact, what is most critical? What has been most critical for you in that in this this existing aftermath you're going through? The counselling is a, is an obvious one, and you've managed to sort that out now through. Um, Winston's wish. Through Winston's wish. Yeah. Uh, what else, Sammy? Practical counselling support for my daughters. I think once children hit 18, they're not same as children. They're not same as children because they're technically classed as adults. They're not same the same. Their trauma is not considered the same as a young child. And they're not seen as dependence either, when there no. is still a dependency. Yeah. Because... Jamie was still a stepdad. Yes. Jamie was, you know, yeah. Yeah, there's still that dependency. That's exactly it. And I think for them to have absolutely nothing, no, and I mean zero from anywhere for anything, it's shocking. Shocking. Just because my daughters are 29 and, and 25 does not mean that they do not need uh, help. They do. They do. Um, this is a man who was effectively their father. Um, they idolised him. They had very, you know, I know some uh, families, blended families, sometimes have difficulty, uh, children and parents and step-parents. And we never had that. Um, he, we were just a perfect fit for each other, all of us. Um, and my girls are absolutely idolised him. Yeah, so their pain is just as difficult and as real and raw as it is for Lucas uh, and him being 13. Mm. So there's, there's, there's nothing like that in place, really, for them. There's really nothing in place for me unless I want to speak to somebody else from the Army Welfare Service. Um, so for me, I just... I have to have something to do. I have to plod on. I have to keep going. I have to keep telling the story. I have to keep getting it out there. And I'll tell it to anybody that will listen to me because I do not want these points as raised to continue for other people, for families uh, that come after me. We can't catch everybody in the net that we want to put out there for uh, service personnel. So there will inevitably be other deaths, unfortunately. Um, I don't want those people to have this kind of experience because it, it, it's easy to do it right. It's easy to do it right. It's not hard. It's not complicated. Um, and nobody should have the experience I had. I've kind of just filed it away in a little, in a little box that I'll probably give some attention to at a later date, but at this moment in time, I don't want to go there because, oh, I'm going to get really angry. I'm going to get, few, I know I'll have to do this eventually. Um, but I'm, I'll, I'll be really honest with you, I'm scared of taking the lid off because I'll just, it'll be like a powder keg. And I, to somebody like me, you don't like you know, I don't like flying or, or because I like to be in control. I like driving because I'm in control of my own car. So uh, um, I can be very measured with my emotions. Um, I rarely share them, although I'm getting better now. Um, it's th this, this shouldn't be a situation that anybody else finds themselves in, ever. No, I agree. And blowing the lid is, uh, I can't agree with that. It's not, it's not the right move. Um, no. And being measured, measuring your approach is absolutely the right thing to do. And the, the thing here uh, is, I mean, look, you, you can't stop. You can't, you can't to say we don't ever, there should never be a suicide. There should never be a military suicide. And that's what should, that, they should never, it should never happen. Well, that's, that's, that's foolish thinking. Okay, it's gonna happen. It's a bit of a pipe but dream. Jesus Christ, can you reduce it? Yes. Oh my God, it should be an in extremis event. Okay, and in the case of, uh, I mean, in Jamie, Jamie's case, this is a prime example. I think. Okay, it's a prime example of the massive gap that is missed. This is a thing. It should never have happened. Okay. No. 
there is a prime example of there was an event, okay, and it was preceded by, as you say, stack trauma, which stack trauma. again, Mandy Bostock and I listened to episode 99. Um, she has yes. spoken about that compounding the effect of repeated trauma, but there, but there was an event, Malawi, that was identified as an issue. He flagged that it was an issue, acute um, stress reaction. Acute stress reaction part of that. But there's that massive gap between that and the point where he actually decided he's going to take his own life, and he actually did it. Months and months and months and months. Mm -hmm. All that should have been filled with whatever process, repeated, monitoring, yeah. screening. And I'm not talking intrusive. This isn't intrusive stuff. This is touching base. This is getting Jamie in once a week, once it's or whatever. A soft this is keeping approach. an eye on. This is this is this is managing an injury. Yes. It's managing an illness. If you I if you break your flipping leg, if Jamie had broken his leg in Malawi, okay, there would have been a process he'd have to go through until he was mended until yes. he, and he would not be allowed back in service, back deployable, okay, until he was fully mended, and they yeah. checked that. The same process needs to exist for mental. Okay. How serious is this? Let's identify it. Okay, we're not how, she, how serious this injury, this illness is, in this case mental. Right, we need to monitor this closely because the cause of it was quite a significant incident, yes. which you was part of. Let's monitor this closely until we really understand how serious it is. That's what should happen. Yes. Yeah. And That's then you exactly only release the patient, which is what Jamie should have been. You only release the patient out of care until he's sorted. Now, when I say out of care, I'm not saying someone has a traumatic incident and they get, for example, here an acute stress reaction. It doesn't mean, oh, you can't go into work. No, you carry on with your work. In Jamie's case, this is probably taken him away from work, but it broken him even quicker. Yeah. So you carry on with work, but you add into it those those mechanisms. A bloke with a broken leg or a woman with a broken leg, they're still going to work, they still do what they can do. That's it. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it should be the same process of mental injury, mental illness. We should not be treating it. It shouldn't be treated any different. No, I agree. Look at it in exactly the same way. And and this is this is why I am glad that we had this conversation Me because too. of this. And again, I saw, you know we had this discussion in the car. Don't want this to turn into a mudslinging no, no, thing no, because no. it is not. This it is, is not. this is a okay. This is the situation that happened. This is. You know, this is worst case now with pair ship, and this is your experience that you had, Jamie's experience that he's had. This is the gap; it needs to be fucking plugged. Because this, in my eyes, is the worst example. This is the this is the the worst kind of ex worst example, the worst care, the worst way I think could have been dealt with. I think it could only have been any worse if there was no sort of acute. You know, there was no d diagnosis of anything at the start. You know, there was no acute uh, acute um, stress, stress reaction. reaction. Yeah. Uh, which was only prompted by him flagging himself up in the first place. This is what the problem is. It needs to be proactive, and then, proactive, and then uh, in terms of having these processes and, and things in place, and then being proactive as an, as an incident or a traumatic event. Okay, let's be proactive and go to the people who may be impacted. Let us go to them, not wait for them to come to us, because one, it might be too late, and two, they might never come. And then, and then what happens is you get you get a he ain't here anymore. Is what happens. That's exactly what happens. Um, everything that you've just said is uh, spot on, um, and that the, the points we've raised and the points we've discussed um, in this podcast are exactly why I reached out to you. Um, yes, my experience was a negative one, but that doesn't have to continue. It doesn't ever have to happen again, ever. Um, and I know, I know he would be bitterly disappointed and he would be fucking angry if he knew this was, uh, you know, this is what happened after he died. He'd be fuming, absolutely fuming. But I can't change that for me. But hopefully, uh, by continuing to talk about it, this we can change it for other people and like I just said it doesn't have to be a bloody negative experience um, it can, it's never going to be a bloody positive experience you know but it doesn't have to be uh, the experience I had is there anything in in fact 
he gave you that notebook, didn't he? Read what it says in the front. Read what it says. So this notebook. So Ma, uh, Sammy brought the notebook with some points in it she wanted to make, remember. And the front of the notebook. So Jamie gave her this notebook. Go on, read what it says in the front of the notebook. <laughs> List of people I want to punch in the face by Sammy Ferguson. <laughs> Is my name in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Is there anything you haven't we haven't we haven't talked about? I don't either? think so. I'll literally just check my notes now. Um, I'm surprised I can read my own handwriting. No, I think I've spoken about everything I've brought down. Okay. Um, Thank you for reaching out. Uh, Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it, more than I could probably express. Well, it's an important conversation, Sammy. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it'll help. It'll help. I hope so. I hope so. And I'll always talk about, uh, I'll always talk about this story. And as long as anybody wants to listen and, um, I'll, you know, if anybody ever wants to speak to me, reach out to me, please do so. Um, I will speak to anybody. I'm, I'm a canny listener. I'm not bad. Um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody, anybody that wants to know more about Jamie or more about his story or uh, anything. I'm happy to speak to anybody. I think it's really, really important that everybody continues to talk. Um, Just make sure you balance that burden in yourself up with other people's problems with sorting yourself and your family out as well. I know you've already thought about that. The same. Yeah. Um, you can become a bit of a sin eater um, and it's kind of difficult then to draw the line um, but I know where my lines are look at me um, and you're right you have to balance it you have to balance it it can't be at the detriment of your own self um, but I'm, I'm pretty good at spotting that and if I don't spot it my kids will <laughs> so yeah. they, they keep me on the right track so can you just quickly, not quickly, the, the, Nick, so the two charities that help me out on the kids' side of things. Yes. Scotty's at the Soldiers is one. Raising Nicky Scott will be on the podcast in the future. Excellent. Um, and Winston's Wishes is the other one. And Winston's specific, Wish. Winston's Wish. Yes. So explain what they do. Uh, they uh, give practical help and counselling to bereaved children. Okay. Anyone else you want to mention um, to him at all? Um, really, I I want to say it all is, you know, this has had a massive effect on Jamie's friends, a detrimental effect on his friends. You know, um, and I I want them to know that I I will always be here for them. They will always be part of my life and will always have my support. My family have been immense. My friends have been immense. Um, and. I couldn't have got through the past few months without everybody that's been in my life played, you know, their part. My visiting officer has been outstanding, um, and probably a lot of other people that I've forgot to mention because I'm terrible at trying to remember things. But uh, yeah, especially my family, the kids have definitely got me through. This. Um, and the one thing I always say whenever I talk about him whenever I mention him whenever I have a conversation with somebody about him is and it's always the hardest thing for me to say is I'll always wait for him to come home always because he went out that day and I was still I was still waiting for him to come home and I think I'll always do that Sorry, we're done. Thank you. Thanks.